All right, let's get started today. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Illinois EPA Office of Energy Public Water Infrastructure Energy Efficiency Program webinar, Oxygen Transfer Efficiency for Lagoon Systems. So we appreciate, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. So in our webinar, we'll review the basics of oxygen transfer, compare different aeration technologies, and discuss energy efficiency opportunities throughout this session. My colleague Ryan Siegel will be joining us later today to present on the second half of the session. And we'll, this session will be about an hour long and will be recorded. We'll also host a Q&A at the end of the event. So if you have questions throughout today's session and today's webinar, please place them either in the Q&A box or in the chat. We'll answer them at the end of the session. Um, please also feel free to use the chat throughout today's event to connect with other attendees. And thanks everybody for saying hello. Uh, if you haven't yet, um, please pop in the chat and say hi. Um, all attendees today, of course, will qualify for one CEU or PDH for attending. Um, so I will be actually sending certificates to everybody. So you don't need to request um, a certificate. So if you're here, I will send one out to you. Um, and I will send them out probably either later today or tomorrow with today's recorded session. So it's coming your way soon. Thanks for joining us. Finally, we'll have some polls during today's webinar session. So please be ready to share your responses. All right, I think that takes care of all of our um, business before we get started. So let's dive in. So I just wanted to mention who we are. Um, again, my name is Cassie Carroll. I'm the Marketing and Outreach Program Manager here at CDAC, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. And um, what we do is we assist buildings and communities in achieving energy efficiency, saving money, and ultimately just becoming more sustainable. We're an applied research program at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and really we just wanna help people reduce um, their energy footprint. Um, and so at CDAC, we partner with the Illinois EPA Office of Energy and the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center to run the um, Public Water Infrastructure Energy Assessment Program. And really, this program helps municipalities reduce the cost of water and wastewater treatment. So in this program, we kind of have three different facets. One is our free energy assessments. Um, we also provide technical assistance. So if your plant really isn't a good fit for an energy assessment or if you've already had one and you're working on energy projects, we can help you actually do some energy efficiency calculations, help you identify funding sources for those projects and just explore maybe whether a technology, an energy efficient technology might be good for you. Um, we also um, provide these events. Um, so continuing education events where we're pleased to be able to offer these um, and tying energy efficiency to water and wastewater treatment. And of course our energy assessments um, are a big portion of this program. And we really, um, through our energy assessments, provide comprehensive reports um, for energy saving opportunities at your facilities. So those reports actually um, include the cost of, potential cost of upgrades, estimated payback periods, and applicable incentives and funding opportunities for you. So they're really a comprehensive roadmap to help you reduce your energy use at your facility and also help you um, save money, of course, and, and run a more efficient plant. Um, so why actually complete an assessment? So we have um, some plants are older or existing systems or maybe haven't had an assessment before. You know, it's a great opportunity to identify ways to conserve, um, update new technology to more energy efficient technology, or identify any missed opportunities for savings. Um, it also really can help you plan for capital improvements, understanding the payback for an, uh, an investment or any funding available. And then of course, the, the assessments really help support your ideas and your goals. So if there's things that you're, questioning or, or investigating at your plant, we can look into that um, and through an energy assessment. If your plant's a little bit newer or recently upgraded, there's always room to improve. So um, whether it, we find opportunities or we just give you a big thumbs up that says, hey, you're doing a really great job um, at efficiency at your plant, it's always great to have um, that information at hand. So the assessments can also help you plan for future opportunities outside the scope of your recent work or investigate new technologies and processes to help increase the efficiency of your plant. 
So at the crux of this program, we're really helping you identify opportunities for repairs and upgrades and funding available for those. So it's really an awesome opportunity to get an assessment and investigation of your plant. So what does it look like? Um, so there's a pre-qualification process. So you can either apply at that website on listed on the slide, or you can just contact me um, and uh, I can get the assessment process started for you. So to qualify, you actually have to be located in Illinois and be a publicly owned treatment plant. Um, you also have to be okay with either us at CDAC or the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center um, coming to visit the site. And if you're not comfortable with that, we can also do remote site assessments. Um, you also need to be willing to share facility information and utility data, and then share the final assessment report with the Illinois EPA Office of Energy. Um, so those are the pre-qualifications. We can go through that over the phone really quickly. And then dive into step two, which is data collection. So we collect some basic facility information. Um, we collect two years of utility data um, and we actually pull your DMRs from Illinois EPA, um, but we just ask for some general information about the plant. And that's really all um, that you have to do to participate in an assessment, help facilitate um, the collection of that data and then actually schedule a site assessment with us, which is the next step. Once we get that data, we can come out to your site and do a site assessment. Site assessments usually take one to three hours. And we really just walk around from start to finish in your process and, um, and take a lot of photos and find and uncover opportunities for energy savings. We then go back, create a comprehensive report, present that to you, and then that can be your tool to integrate energy saving opportunities. So if you're interested, um, again, you can apply on our website or reach out to me and I can get you rolling. Probably takes about a half an hour to collect the basic data and go through those pre-qualification questions. Um, and then we can get started towards the assessment. So it's a great opportunity, great idea, and it's no cost. So take advantage of it if you would like. All right, so let's dig into our um, content for today. We're gonna to do a quick review of some of the points from our previous presentation on aeration and energy. So if you participated in the first session of the series, this will be a nice refresher. Um, and if you didn't attend the previous presentation and you're interested in learning more, those presentations are actually available on our website. Um, I will pop those in the link uh, later in, or that link in the chat later in today's session. So let's do a quick review. Um, Let's look at the big picture when it comes to aeration. We have carbon and ammonia entering our wastewater from humid activities, and this produces biological oxygen demand, or BOD. Microbes need oxygen to break down contamination. Wastewater systems, of course, provide a critical role of providing oxygen to supply the BO or the supply the required BOD. And zooming in a little bit, this BOD test is a chemical dot test that's conducted over five days to model natural uptake of BOD in streams. And our goal is to get rid of the BOD so it doesn't end up in our natural waterways and deplete the oxygen and possibly kill organisms. From the illustration on the left, when the DO or dissolved oxygen level is at six milligrams per liter, we have a nice happy fish. Uh, however, when the DO level goes down to one milligram per liter, um, well, you can see the fish isn't very happy anymore on the right there. While nature does have its natural methods of dealing with BOD, we don't want to take that for granted and release nutrients um, uncontrolled in waterways. Alternatively, working a treat um, to achieve BO zero BOD is not cost effective and would lead to extremely high utility consumption bills, which we don't want. To understand how much oxygen is needed, we can take the concentration of BOD and apply the amount of flow and then convert that to number of pounds of material. This can allow us to estimate how much oxygen is needed to treat that demand. So one of the key factors of BOD is dissolved oxygen or DO, which I'm sure you all are familiar of. Um, DO is measured in milligrams of free oxygen molecules per liter of water. It's a concentration in a moment in time which is important to keep in mind because it doesn't predict the future levels and what those will look like. So in a lagoon treatment, too little DO results in incomplete nutrient removal and non-compliance. Oxygen transfer rate is the rate at which a system is dissolving oxygen into water. So this is how much your oxygen uh, or how much oxygen your blowers or aerators are putting into the lagoon or how much air your surface aerators are bringing into the lagoon. 
The goal is to balance the oxygen transfer rate um, and that should equal the BOD demand and how much oxygen is needed for those microbes to do their job. When we accomplish that, we maintain a steady DO concentration and avoid swings in oxygen levels. So if we have a scenario with low oxygen transfer rate and a high BOD, then the concentration will naturally decrease causing low DO concentration. This will cause poor water quality, inadequate treatment of the water, and potentially kill aquatic life downstream. So on the other hand, if we have the opposite scenario with a high oxygen transfer rate and a low BOD, then you end up with dissolved oxygen in your system. While you don't affect the natural ecosystem or aquatic life downstream, you end up introducing more dissolved oxygen that's needed, which means, oops, here, there's this one, sorry. <laughs> which means you're wasting energy and money on utilities and emitting more GHGs into the environment from energy production. So this excess oxygen will bubble off because of the saturation. So you're wasting all of that good oxygen and spending more money to over aerate your wastewater. So in cold weather for this example, let's say we use 39 degrees, DO saturation is at about 11 milligrams per liter. In warmer weather, say 70 degrees, saturation is more like 8.7 milligrams per liter. You know, a lot of us are aiming to maintain that six milligrams per liter of DO. And if we're significantly above that on a regular basis, we're really wasting a lot of energy and not actually improving our treatment. Also, if you starve your microbes of oxygen, they slow down and can't do their job. Um, alternatively, if you provide too much oxygen, the microbes slow down and aren't as effective. So therefore you have to maintain this really delicate balance of oxygen transfer rate and your BOD. All right, so now that we've reviewed some scenarios of high and low concentrations, what happens if they are in balance? So we can now see why balancing oxygen transfer rates and BOD are important to understanding aeration and the effects on energy use and aquatic life. It's critical to minimizing and the utility costs and treating your water effectively. So now that we've gone through that um, review, let's look at some uh, different oxygen transfer terms and factors. So on this slide, you can see that we have three key oxygen transfer terms. So we have the standard, and standard oxygen transfer rate, um, which we actually just reviewed. Standard oxygen transfer efficiency, though, is the measurement of how much oxygen is transferred by a given aerator in clean water. This oxygen transfer efficiency is used to calculate how much air is required to provide necessary oxygen for treatment. A high efficiency indicates less air required, and theoretically, all oxygen supply will be transferred. But of course, that's unlikely. Oxygen transfer efficiency can be calculated by taking the oxygen transfer rate and dividing it by the oxygen supply rate. We also have our standard aeration efficiency or SAE. The aeration efficiency can be calculated by taking the standard oxygen transfer rate and dividing it by the blower power input. SAE is used to compare the energy efficiency of different aerators and this will also allow you to analyze the operating costs of different aeration technologies. So to increase our aeration efficiency, we want to reduce the blower power input, which can be done through blower selection and blower speed management. You know, and these efficiencies are also impacted by bubble size, contact time, and mixing. So those are the key terms. Um, let's go into a little bit about correction factors. There are many correction factors um, that you can use when calculating aeration efficiency, but we're going to focus on three of those today. So first we have the alpha factor, um, and that's also known as the contamination factor. It's the ratio of processes or of processes to clean water uh, mass transfer. It accounts for the contaminants in the wastewater and is impacted by soaps and detergents. The significance of the alpha factor is really dependent on the contaminated located or the contaminants located in the wastewater. Higher alpha values indicate better oxygen transfer performance. Fine bubbles have a large surface area relative to their volume, understanding that the transfer interface is only at the bubble surface and thus effectively would have higher alpha factors. However, they're more prone to interference by surfactants or surfactants such as soap and detergents that reduce gas transfer across the air liquid film of a bubble. Small bubbles also rise more slowly 
reducing the ability to mix and contact more microbes in the water. This can also suppress the alpha factor for fine bubbles as surfactants can build up uh, more easily. So the increased rise, speed, and turbulence created by larger bubbles reduce that surfactant coating of the air bubble and maintains a higher alpha factor. As water gets cleaner, the aeration alpha factor will improve. This contributes to why most lagoons have a tapered aeration strategy with more aerators in the primary lagoon and fewer, if any, in the polishing lagoon. Surface aeration uh, system values can range from 0.75 0.9, as you can see on our slide. Uh, fine bubble aeration tanks, the alpha value can range from 0.4 to 0.7. And coarse bubble aeration tanks, the factor can range from uh, 0.6 to 0.95. All right, so let's go to the beta factor. It's also the saturation factor. It's actually used to correct the dissolved solids or for the dissolved solids in wastewater. The solubility of oxygen in wastewater is about 95 to 99% of pure water. So as a result, the beta is usually understood uh, to be in the range of 0.95 to 0.99, unless dissolved oxygens are extremely high. All right, let's move to the theta factor. It's also known as the correction for the temperature of the wastewater. It is commonly understood to be 1.024. All right, so we've gone through a lot of information. Let's go into a quick poll question. Um, Ryan's gonna bring up that poll for us here. Okay, which of these factors is most difficult to accurately determine one of these correction factors? Is it the alpha or contamination factor, beta, saturation factor, or theta, the temperature factor? We'll give you a few minutes to provide your response um, and, uh, and then we will share the results. All right, I see a lot of good responses coming in. You guys are ready <laughs> for the poll. I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, I see some more coming in. All right, Ryan, if you wanna close that poll here, we'll share the results. All right, the correct answer, which most of you got was the alpha factor, the contamination factor because it's really dependent on soaps and detergents. Um, you know, it's really difficult to test for those and usually is the most variable factor. You know, you, the, any concentration of wastewater can have a different amount of soaps and detergents in, in the water. So great. Well, thank you for participating in the poll. Um, we'll have another couple coming up here soon. All right. Let's go into the actual oxygen requirements. So here's an equation um, for those requirements. And you can see where those little correction factors are located in the equation. Um, they're highlighted on the screen. So the alpha, beta, and theta factors. You can see how each of these correction factors really play a role in determining the amount of required oxygen for proper wastewater treatment. These factors are not only critical for designing systems, of course, to meet their oxygen requirements, but they're also important factors to consider when investigating operational efficiencies and plant upgrades. All right, another correction factor to consider, whoops, I think I skipped a slide, there we go, is following. On the top right image, you can see diffusers that are in good condition. In the bottom range, these diffusers, uh, these are diffusers with signs of fouling. Foul diffusers lead to an increase in, increased frequency of pressure drops also known as dynamic wet pressure. Fouling is likely to lead to an increase in energy consumption in order to overcome those high pressure drops. Foul diffusers also cause oxygen transfer rates of diffusers to decrease. Because the diffusers are fouling, it may cause issues with maintaining the ability for the plant to remain at its rated capacity. So on one hand, we've seen that most plants are designed with a higher capacity when needed to accommodate future growth. We've also observed that many of these growth projections haven't been realized in some communities and the population might be actually declining. This leaves us with plants that are grossly oversized for their needs and using way more energy to maintain their plant's capacity, even though the plant is not even near its full design capacity. Even if fouling isn't bad enough to impair the oxygen transfer, cleaning diffusers periodically can reduce overall energy consumption. All right, we got another poll coming up here. Um, this question is, which of the following is a possible result of foul diffusers? 
um, please select all that apply or um, actually just select your best guess. It's a single choice. So large pressure drops, decrease oxygen transfer rate, what blowers may surge, or is it all of the above? I'll give you a, a few seconds here to respond. All right, I love seeing these responses come flowing in. Thank you. We'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, Ryan, go ahead and close that poll for us and share the results. Thank you. All right, the answer is all of the above. Most of you got it correct. Um, but all of you answered correctly. All of these are um, possible results of foul diffusers. So we spoke about the higher pressure drops and oxygen transfer rates. But when you have higher pressure drops, you also risk the pressure increasing beyond the safe range, which can cause blowers to surge. So all of these points here can be outcomes from foul diffusers. Awesome. Thanks so much for participating. All right, let me go to the next slide here. There's also some aeration process factors um, that affect uh, the microbes' ability to absorb and process oxygen. So one of the primary factors is temperature. Um, as I mentioned before, cooler air contains more air per unit volume, which can allow plants to actually turn back their aeration equipment further in the winter. Microbe activity also tends to decrease with temperature, which reduces the immediate need for air. As blower demand is then reduced, retention time needs to be, may need to be extended in the winter to achieve the same level of treatment as in summer or warmer conditions. Time, of course, is another key factor. The longer the liquid is retained for processing, the less processing time is, or less processing required per unit of time. This is closely related to oxygen concentration and mixing. Decreased time, concentration or mixing requires one or both of these factors to increase for the same treatment. Decreased activity of microbes also reduces the immediate need of air and aeration. Aeration technologies and diffuser placement also have a substantial impact on oxygen transfer rate. And Ryan will be speaking on these factors later today in our session. Finally, let's talk about aeration cycling. Depending on the type of equipment at your plant, you may want to consider cycling your basins between oxic and anoxic. We've seen many plants with oversized equipment that aren't able to turn down, and they end up operating closer to DO levels that are four to six milligrams per liter, rather than the target of two to three milligrams per liter of DO. Cycling can reduce energy costs by allowing the BOD to absorb the additional oxygen, bringing the DO levels down, and then cycling the aeration to change the basin or to charge the basin with oxygen. So typically, We've seen these operate for an hour on, three hours off, giving you about six cycles per day. So that might be an option for your type of plant as well. Okay, so let's dig into some aeration technology comparisons. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ryan, um, to talk about different technologies. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, looking at some of the, did we lose our screen here one moment? There we go. Uh, looking at some of the different aeration uh, technologies, one benefit that we do see, uh, and, and one feature, you know, before we dive right into uh, technologies and trying to throw technology at an issue, uh, you know, best to see what natural or, or passive opportunities may exist uh, as they can operate regardless of the availability of the utility. You know, so one benefit that, that most of you probably see uh, with your lagoons over, you know, activated sludge counterparts is the ability to uh, have such a large surface area, uh, which uh, can be useful for uh, providing that aeration interface uh, between the, the oxygen and the uh, water. And so, you know, activated sludge systems since they have a fairly low surface interface area you know typically have to add uh, substantial quantities of air uh, now for lagoons because they do have uh, a larger surface contact area you know that can allow for much more uh, natural uh, interface to occur and 
understanding that that you know while providing a deeper lagoon uh, does reduce the relative surface area you know this may be able to provide a little bit better uh, biological control if the the sunlight is not able to uh, penetrate all the way to the bottom of the lagoon, uh, causing a lot of uh, algae and biological growth at the bottom. So uh, this can be a little bit of a double-edged sword for you. you know, one other uh, feature is uh, algae can be uh, very useful as far as uh, providing some of that treatment. Uh, and we have seen uh, several systems out there, uh, formerly with biological control uh, biological contact uh, tanks uh, and other, you know, algae can be useful in providing some of the treatment for a lagoon. Uh, now there can be some, some issues as far as swings between day and night uh, with that, uh, but kind of what, what we're looking at here is, you know, this is kind of what we're seeing uh, occurring in the Mississippi Delta, uh, where we have seen a lot of excess uh, nutrients flowing down, uh, which then leads to algae blooms. Uh, and then uh, with those algae blooms, it's absorbing all that, uh, all that oxygen leading to, to eutrophication. And so, uh, you know, understanding that this algae process uh, can be beneficial uh, in, in trying to have that occur in a, in a much more controlled situation. So uh, as we're noting here, uh, algae does boost your oxygen levels during the day, uh, but unfortunately at night it's absorbing that oxygen uh, out of the water. Uh, so what we could be able to do with that is, you know, lagoons might be able to uh, benefit from adding air in the uh, at night to compensate for that algae trying to absorb that oxygen out of the lagoon. And so kind of uh, running the lagoons almost on an off cycle or an off peak cycle, uh, which may also be helpful to your local grid too. So, you know, this natural oxygen production uh, can provide a, a convenient means to reduce that energy consumption during the day. Uh, so, and understanding that, you know, with this uh, cycling, you know, this dissolved oxygen can vary rather dramatically over a 24 hour period. You know, it's not uncommon to see dissolved uh, oxygen being, you know, two to three times saturation in the middle of the afternoon because of all this photosynthesis by the algae. Uh, and then at night, you know, DO dropping to a very low level uh, with the, the bacterial and algal respiration that's occurring. Uh, so being aware of this, and this is something else uh, that people may uh, talk about as far as understanding what this cycle looks like for any time you're going to do some of your testing. You know, we want to make sure that, that you're doing your testing to be representative uh, of what is really going on in the lagoon. So, you know, performing your testing in the middle of the afternoon uh, or, or late at night, you know, is likely to lead to uh, to results that are not really representative of what's happening over the course of a, an entire day. Uh, and so understanding where this cycling is so that you're able to, you know, grab that representative sample for you. So, you know, understanding that if we do uh, need to supplement, which typically we do, uh, you know, surface aeration comes in, in many different forms. You know, many of these have different benefits and detriments. Uh, overall surface aerators are easier to install as well as move around uh, the lagoons as needed. So you may find that for your lagoon, uh, in order to get uh, good mixing and, and uh, good aeration, you might tend to move the aerators around your lagoon periodically uh, so that they're mixing different zones of the lagoon uh, so that you don't end up with a lot of buildup uh, between your aerators. Uh, so you might periodically shift those around. So uh, they also ha tend to benefit uh, shallow lagoons more uh, for these because again, you're not trying to mix all the way to the bottom where that uh, anaerobic area is, you know, trying not to uh, totally disturb the anaerobic, anoxic, anoxic zones in yours. So 
with these surface aerators, they're typically operating more for the mixing and flow conditioning than specifically for the aeration uh, alone. On the downside, surface aerators can be affected uh, substantially by cold. Uh, when the water around the units freeze, it can lead to uh, damage of the aerators. You know, understanding that since there's also moving parts in the water, uh, maintenance cycles may also be shorter uh, for these surface aerators. So you may be trading some of this cheaper first cost uh, for increasing labor and material costs. So uh, mixing may be fairly limited, uh, particularly for your deeper lagoons, uh, as surface mixing uh, is creating a fairly small uh, fluid motion. You know, and understanding that uh, for these surface aerators, they come in a couple of different types. Uh, the first shown here are more water to air aeration, where we're trying to take water out of the lagoon and force it up to contact that air. Uh, the second type is more of an air to water aeration. Uh, so rather than trying to uh, force the uh, water into the air, here we're introducing air into the water. So, and understanding what is our objective with this aeration. You know, you can have mixing and you can have uh, providing of air. And so, as Cassie mentioned earlier, fine bubble aeration uh, can provide much better oxygen transfer due to those much smaller uh, bubbles in a much larger surface area for every volume of air that you're transferring. Uh, but coarse bubble can provide better mixing. Uh, you know, trying to mix an entire lagoon uh, if you're, can be very difficult with uh, aeration, just from the aspect of you have a very large surface area that you're trying to cover. Uh, instead, what we're trying to more commonly do is create a draft with that air column uh, to get that lagoon to cycle uh, in bringing the water from the bottom of the lagoon up to the top to contact that surface. So, while aeration and mixing are commonly provided by the same equipment, it's not always the case that we're trying to primarily mix or primarily aerate. Uh, and so, the key getting to trying to get the oxygen, the bugs, and the nutrients in the same place at the same time. Uh, so while aeration is key, mixing is also a crucial step for lagoons. And so here, seeing that we do have several uh, different types of aeration equipment, looking to introduce air into the, ox uh, air into the water, the disc diffuser and linear diffuser models are designed to be lowered into the bottom of the lagoon and the horizontal aspirator and the vertical jets are seen, those are more surface aerators and work to push the air down into the lagoon. Uh, however, overall, air to water aerations are generally more efficient than water to air. Uh, it's a lot easier to push air into water than to try to pick water up. So as far as producing that air, uh, depending on what type of system you're using. Uh, so these are more for your like your disc diffusers and linear diffusers. And you know once we've identified our aerators, you know many of these do require an external source of air. Uh, most small facilities that we see uh, use rotary low blowers because they have a fairly low installation cost. Uh, Mid-sized facilities uh, we see because they are a little more generally they're a little more focused on energy upgrades, uh, may have used screw uh, blowers. Uh, and this is a very nice uh, upgrade. If you do have rotary lobe blowers, considering moving to rotary screw blowers due to their higher efficiency. Uh, both of these have some very good turndowns because they are both positive displacement units, uh, and which allows them to provide the same pressure regardless of the speed and the flow which can dramatically, uh, these systems also can dramatically reduce their noise uh, levels as the speed decreases. So commonly the limiting factor we run into here is the heat dissipation uh, that's, a, that's being transferred into that air uh, under a certain threshold. You may have difficulty trying to transfer the heat out of the motor into the air to go out to the lagoon. Uh, and so building up 
the heat in the motor can be very uh, detrimental. So. The other type of blower that we commonly see, and these are more for larger uh, systems, are centrifugal blowers. Uh, these could be either single or multi-stage. Uh, these operate generally at a little bit higher efficiencies uh, than their positive displacement counterparts. However, they're impacted uh, substantially by uh, the ambient entering air conditions, uh, whereas positive displacements are a little uh, less impacted by that. And the other common issue is the amount of turndown that you can get. You know, how far can you back off the blower before you start to enter some of these surge conditions? So, uh, turbo blowers are, are now more available in smaller sizes than they previously were, uh, and they can ver have very high efficiencies. Uh, but again, uh, if you do have uh, your lagoon and you are looking at uh, cycling the air based on time of day, uh, turbo blower bearings uh, can be worn down fairly quickly due to cycling. Uh, so that is something if you are looking and considering a turbo blower, be sure that you're asking your uh, manufacturer's representatives as far as, you know, what is the cycling, you know, what is that going to impact on that? Uh, and so making sure that you're understanding not not just what is the efficiency factor uh, today, but what is that maintenance going to look like long term? So, as we touched on, you know, have a few different types of blowers, you know, and primarily the overall aeration efficiency is impacted by two factors the baseline efficiency of the blower system and its ability to turn down to handle those lower flows or lower loads uh, on your system. And so due to the potential for algae to create large swings in aeration demand, positive displacements uh, may be a better choice because of they, they do have that much better turn down uh, capacity. Uh, so we might see these generally being more desirable for uh, lagoon applications to maintain the overall higher system efficiency, even if it may not be as high efficiency at a particular point in time. So uh, let's touch on a, a few system considerations. Uh, understanding that aeration is an overall system, we want to make sure that we are uh, considering all the different points along the chain. You know, too often we focus on the generation of that air uh, and then uh, the distribution is the other piece that gets a lot of attention. Uh, and while they are both important, you know, delivery is another piece uh, that is uh, also important to consider because air is so compressible that in the event that you, uh, you can generate it and distribute it very efficiently, uh, neglecting that delivery piece uh, can negatively impact your overall system efficiency. So, you know, air generation, this is what people think of, you know, when they're thinking of efficiency, which makes sense because this is where the electrical power is actually going. Uh, and so understanding that while many lagoons can and do cycle aeration, uh, efficiency of generation becomes less critical as it's hard to save more than off. Uh, so, with lagoons having larger swings uh, in aeration demand due to algae and other biological uh, impacts on the DO concentration, turn down capability and the ability to easily cycle blowers on and off are likely to have a greater impact on your system efficiency than that peak efficiency operation. Uh, rarely do we see blowers operating at their peak efficiency uh, point for extended periods of time, just purely because systems are, are not loaded at their peak uh, all the time. So, you know, again, you know, understanding that even though the, the peak efficiency of positive displacement blower systems is commonly lower, uh, because they're commonly low operate at uh, part load, they may end up having a, a 
better system efficiency over the course of the whole year uh, than their centrifugal counterparts. Yeah. The other side of this is understanding, you know, we're trying to get air from the generation out to the system. And so another large factory is, factor is delivering that air from blowers out to the aeration system. This includes all the piping and valves along the way. The more piping there is, the more potential there are for leaks. Uh, this is particularly true for underground piping, uh, which may leak and commonly does leak without being obvious until it gets to a point where the ground starts to bubble when it rains, uh, which is kind of what we're, we're showing here in this uh, upper center picture. Uh, the, the ground at this facility uh, actually looked like it was carbonated because uh, it was very wet that day. Uh, so fortunately for lagoons uh, that do have external aeration equipment, you know, mostly this is located uh, adjacent to the lagoons, trying to avoid some of those delivery costs uh, and delivery losses. So if you presently do have uh, remote aeration systems and then that is piped all the way out to your systems or out to the lagoons, you might consider uh, relocating those aeration systems when the time comes uh, to replace or upgrade uh, your aeration system to avoid some of those future headaches from piping losses. Uh, we've also seen several facilities that, you know, if they were unable to uh, relocate uh, the blowers to be more proximate to the lagoons, they have switched from underground piping uh, to above ground piping, uh, which makes uh, leaks easier to identify and make the repair uh, without having to uh, dig up a lot of ground. The other side of things is uh, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of great detail, uh, but I do have a, a couple of uh, slides here later on. Uh, but understanding that the the piping length can be very dramatic as far as you know how much pressure loss and and how much of that uh, pressure band that you're using up, and so understanding that minimizing the 90 degree bends and elbows uh, can reduce your effective piping length. Uh, you know, the photo on the right has really taken this, you know, to more of an extreme. You see there's very few uh, 90 degree bends and they've really tried to make the piping as short and uh, short and straight from point A to point B as uh, possible. So this is something that uh, lagoons that do have uh, either direct injection air with aspirating mixers uh, or uh, some other locally uh, generated air source uh, does avoid a lot of these distribution losses. Uh, however, they're all generally a little less uh, efficient than your subsurface aeration. Uh, so that's where trying to strike that balance of, you know, am I looking at this from the overall system perspective, which one is going to be better? With direct aeration, uh, here is noting where we, typically we do see lower efficiency for oxygen transfer, uh, but this does have a few unique benefits. Uh, many of these systems are capable of separating the mixing from the aeration energy, so you can cycle the aeration uh, independent of the mixing, uh, which can increase the overall aeration efficiency uh, by turning off the airflow once you have your, your DO established. Uh, and the surface aerators, again, more easily relocated than the subsurface diffusers uh, and can easily, more easily be adjusted uh, to compensate for issues. You know, you may have some sludge islands develop uh, in trying to mix and break those up, uh, which may lead to uh, short circuiting of lagoons and other problems if you don't address those. So, uh, mention a, a touch a little bit on this. I'm not, again, not going to go into great detail here, uh, but again, just understanding what are, uh, this is up for both air and water. Uh, if you're trying to move it around, understanding the, the smoother you can make these transitions and the less 90 degrees and T's you can have, uh, the better it is. Uh, 
here just from introducing that error at, at a more of a you know straight on angle rather than uh, T intersection where the error has to make a, a short sharp turn. You know this can reduce uh, effective piping length by two thirds. You know, here's another one we may see. Uh, you probably see a lot of this in uh, your lift stations uh, out there in the city. So commonly we'll see a piping arrangement like the one on the left versus a, an alternative on the right here uh, that has a much lower uh, pressure drop and, and much easier time moving fluid through. You know, we can see two thirds to 100% elimination of a lot of that pressure drop from those sharp turns and elbows. So, as far as the, the aeration placement, as the fluid rises, new fluid needs to enter to take its place, which this can cause the lagoon to churn. Uh, and the churn can actually be beneficial uh, and can change depending on where your aerators are located. Uh, similarly, as the fluid stagnates but, uh, or moves down between aerators, then this can cause material to settle. Uh, again, that can either be a benefit or a detriment to you, depending on uh, what you're trying to achieve in that area. So, but lagoons, uh, while they're very good at, at settling, they may need some help circulating that material to maintain that uh, contact. So understanding that the bottom of lagoons typically are uh, anoxic and, and sometimes they can be uh, go so far as to be anaerobic. Some flow and mixing uh, can carry nutrients provided by those microbes in oxic areas to those wanting them further down in the anoxic or anaerobic areas. You know, we don't necessarily want to bring oxygen into the anaerobics, uh, anaerobic areas, as anaerobes don't do well in toxic environments. Uh, but having that, uh, those nutrients move around so that all the different microbes can get what they're looking for, and the different microbes in the different regions transferring uh, those nutrients between zones can be very beneficial. So. Well, activated sludge systems commonly work to achieve, you know, full diffuser coverage as seen on the lower right here. You know, trying to do that for a lagoon would be very expensive, both in first cost and in the energy consumption and cost, just due to the surface area that you're trying to cover uh, with these aeration beds. So it's also unnecessary given the capacity and the large surface interface that lagoons naturally have. And so, Instead, what we see much more common and cost-effective is to have a handful of aerators across the lagoon surface working to induce that flow pattern uh, to get that induced mixing and flow. And understanding that lagoons can further manage flow and mixing uh, through valving uh, or even cycling of different aerators at different times uh, if that's provided in for in that design. Aerator lo locations, you know, each make and model of aeration can provide, and, and sometimes that's even depending on how deep they are, can provide different flow and impact patterns, uh, particularly uh, given that depth of your lagoon. So understanding that what we really wanna make sure that we're avoiding is short circuiting of your lagoon, as this effectively cuts the size of your actual effective lagoon down and doesn't provide your long detention uh, capacity that is normally attributed to lagoons and quite beneficial. Uh, here we're, we're showing a diagram in red where uh, the influent on the left-hand side uh, in red, you know, if can easily uh, just travel directly across this lagoon uh, and short circuiting of a lagoon can be uh, impacted depending on, uh, as we note here, wind direction and sludge accumulation. Uh, and so helping to use those aerators to break up and disrupt any of these short circuit flows uh, can be very beneficial for you. So, with that, I've got another poll here. 
This is what is the most effective aeration in terms of oxygen transfer, uh, surface splashing, subsurface diffusers, or subsurface aspirators. Again, this is for oxygen transfer, what we're trying to do here. And question number two, when oxygen is above what is needed, oxygen transfer is higher, lower, or stays the same. Give a few more seconds here. All right. For the first one, looks like most everyone picked up on, yes, subsurface diffusers is generally the most efficient for oxygen transfer. And uh, number two, looks like there's a, a lot of a lot of back and forth here. Oxygen transfer, when oxygen transfer is above what is needed, oxygen transfer is lower. Uh, as Cassie had touched on this a little bit earlier, when you have too much or too little oxygen, uh, oxygen transfer generally is lower. Uh, so trying to maintain that, that sweet spot of just the right amount of oxygen uh, provides the most benefit there. So a lot of confusion on that last one, but so cover a few takeaways here. So make sure that we hit our high points here. You know, as we noted earlier, pressure is typically our limiting factor for centrifugal and, and turbo blowers, uh, but they can take advantage of affinity of the affinity laws that positive displacement blowers cannot. Uh, but positive displacement blowers uh, can produce flow regardless of pressure. So uh, positive displacement uh, can have a much better turn down than centrifugals, uh, even if they're not able to take advantage of those affinity laws. And so uh, understanding that if you need a lot of load flexibility, you might combine uh, some blower technology. So you might have a centrifugal or, or turbo blower for a higher load and then have a positive displacement blower uh, that handles for times of lower loading. Uh, so you might try to, to work that to get the best of both worlds in there. And what we see here, uh, this plant looked at, uh, chose to go with a multiple blower setup. Uh, so here they can stage these blowers in increments uh, to get what they need. So, and with lagoons, uh, you know, take advantage of your natural oxygen sources uh, wherever you can, because Natural oxygen sources uh, commonly are going to be a very low energy uh, and very energy efficient method for uh, aeration. So, uh, with that, we do have a few uh, webinars coming up that uh, Cassie's going to talk a little bit more about here. Great, yes. So, we do have two. This was the second installment of a three part series on aeration and energy. Um, we have two more webinars coming up in January, um, but they're focused on control strategies for aeration. So, the uh, event for um, uh, Lagoon Systems will be January 25th. And uh, I'm going to send the link here in the chat in just a moment um, for you all to sign up if you haven't. I'll also share it in a message as well following up um, on this event. Um, so we also have a couple other um, things to share. So the USDOE um, actually um, launched a wastewater cohort to help plants um, navigate um, actually meeting 50,001 certification. So it's helping with energy management and benchmarking um, for um, wastewater systems and Cohorts can be groups of sites or municipally um, owned plants, but um, it's a great opportunity to take advantage of free technical assistance and learning from other plants about how they manage energy at their facilities. So if you're interested, um, I will send out these slides afterwards and I'll, send, I'll share the link, but please feel free to investigate that if you're interested. 
And then also um, the University of Illinois Chicago has an event coming up, which I'm putting the link in the chat now, but they have a webinar on developing environmental offsets for anaerobic digestion projects. And they're featuring a case study from Des Moines um, Metropolitan Wastewater Reclamation Authority um, and renewable gas upgrades. So there will be three speakers and they're gonna talk about how they've um, partnered with wastewater facilities on anaerobic digestion. Now I know this isn't terribly applicable to lagoons, but if you're interested in learning, um, the opportunity is available. So please feel free to register. Um, it'll be the 8th of December at 10.30 a.m. and there will be um, one CEU available for participants. So just wanted to let you know about that upcoming event as well. And then finally, um, there's that date for the lagoons. Um, please feel free to register for that. I'll send your reminders as you know closer to the date as well. All right, um, again, this session will be recorded or has been recorded, so we'll provide it afterwards as well. Let's dig into some questions. So we actually do have a comment here from Ben. Um, it's important to note that VFDs applied to blowers generally lead to higher discharge temperatures. This becomes important when deciding when to where to transition to HDPE from DIP or stainless. This is an important role or an important note when looking at retrofits as the last thing any of us want to do is melt someone's air header. <laughs> it's a good point, Ben. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Ryan, do you have any additional comments on that? Uh, not, not in particular, but uh, we, we have seen a lot of plants looking to uh, transition to uh, alternative piping uh, rather than just relying on welded steel. So that's, that's a very good point to, to bring up that uh, be be cognizant of your uh, air temperatures because yeah, as as you're backing off uh, air flow, you know you're now adding more heat to a smaller volume of air, so that that can raise your your <laughs> raise your temperatures. So that's a very good point to bring up. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And um, Ben also noted as you're working with Illinois EPA, are they making any comments about bringing ammonia or phosphorus limits to the state? We actually don't work with the regulatory side of Illinois EPA. Illinois EPA Office of Energy solely focuses on energy efficiency, but that is something that we can ask um, Illinois EPA Bureau of Water to see um, what their comments may be. So let me let us dig into that a little bit and, and get back to you. Ryan, have you heard anything? Uh, we have had several facilities talking about that uh, in their, their upcoming uh, permit discussions with Illinois EPA. And so that is something that, that is a consideration as we're uh, out on site doing uh, assessments is taking a look at and seeing what uh, opportunities or, or what understanding what that impact is likely to be. Uh, we see a lot of uh, facilities where uh, adding that phosphorus removal is actually reducing the load of their aeration system uh, going forward. So blowers that may presently be oversized uh, in order to achieve that phosphorus removal are going to be dramatically oversized. Uh, and so that's where uh, doing sometimes doing some of these uh, more advanced removal techniques uh, can actually uh, treat water better for even less money than you do today. That's a great comment, Ryan. Thank you for that um, information. Cool. Well, does anybody have any more questions? We still have a couple more minutes. Uh, if folks have questions or comments that they'd like to share, um, thanks for everybody who commented in the chat as well. All right. Well, it looks like uh, we have completed today's session. Ryan, anything, any last words to leave us with today? Uh, not at this point. I just want to thank everyone for their taking the time to, to join us today and looking forward to seeing everyone after the new year uh, for the, the third in, in our series. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us again. Today's session was recorded and I will send out the recording after um, once it is uploaded to YouTube. Um, also, again, just to reiterate, I will provide everybody that attended this webinar with a CEU certificate and course number. Um, so don't worry, it'll be coming shortly to your inbox. If you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to either Orion or I, um, and we look forward to helping you in your energy efficiency journey. So have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you in the new year.
Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.